and we will sail on too. Hello and welcome fabulous people to this webcast on elite executive teams. My name is Zoe Routh. I'm a leadership expert and I specialize in the people stuff of leadership. You know, the stuff that keeps you up late at night worrying about Frank and Susan and how they're always at each other's throats or George who just can't seem to get his head out of the detail and how can you get him to think more strategically. Um, those are some minor issues and it can go from minor irritations to huge calamities as you all know because you're all very seasoned and experienced leaders. Uh, so what we're going to cover today is the main framework for looking at going from novice to uh, elite teams and where you might fit with your team at the moment and then the critical pathway to get to wherever you are to the elite status. Isn't that a great word? Elite. <laughs> it's so prejudicial in some ways. But we all want to work on elite executive teams because we get so much more done and we can start to be more visionary and proactive as opposed to reactive and always trying to chase our tails to get work delivered. Uh, so a couple of things about how I like to run webcasts. I like them to be interactive as possible. Um, I like for people to meet each other because part of the value of these programs, uh, of the programs that I run, is the diversity of people in my network. And every single time I run a web webinar or one of my programs, people say that a lot of the value is in meeting their peers. So we do have time today to put you into breakout rooms to have a specific agenda and you can meet each other and mine each other's um, experience. This is a confidential space, so I will not be recording uh, any of the breakout rooms. Not that you can anyway, <laughs> so feel free to share in the breakout rooms. It's completely confidential and I ask you to respect each other there. Um, if you want to ask a question, unmute yourself and ask because I can't look at the screen and check the chat box all at the same time. Um, if you want to applaud something, you can go like this. Important to have the eyebrow raise and mouth expression too. <laughs> If you, or you can use the reaction button on there. That's kind of fun as well. Um, this is a give and take opportunity. So feel free to ask questions and to share knowledge as we go along. All right, this is a short taste of amplifiers. We do have some amplifiers on the call today. So people who are in my high level leadership program, it'll give you an, an experience of me, how I like to run uh, these types of online trainings. If you're considering the online amplifiers session, and so I'll give you a little bit of an insight and experience of that. Um, throughout every webcast that I'm going to be running, I'm going to be giving you do-it-yourself options as well as it do-it-with-me options. Um, so no major sales pitch. It's not my style. And there'll be opportunities if you want to work with me further at the end of each webcast. I will let you know how you can do that. Okay. All right. So for those of you who are meeting me for the first time, I've got a... A few slides, we're not going heavy on the slides because yeah, we can do PowerPoint to death. We will do a few of them though, just to catch a few of the frameworks. So yeah, this is me, oh, hello. I was a little bit excited. Um, this is me in one of my other settings, which is on the Lara Pinta Trail. Oh, so beautiful. I'm heading back there in June to run the whole trail, not run, walk, <laughs> 232 kilometers, just outside of Alice Springs. And the reason I shared this picture is a couple of reasons. To give you a little bit of insight into my background, I've did 30 years working in not-for-profits, majority of that in outdoor experiential settings. So taking teams and leaders out into the outdoors to learn how to uh, work better together and to develop their own personal leadership skills. This also reminds me how important it is to learn how to read a map and literally, <laughs> <laughs> and metaphorically. Metaphorically, it, leadership is like a wilderness. And when you have skills and frameworks, it can help you read the landscape better and to make choices that prevent you from falling into dangerous zones and make better choices to enjoy the, um, the journey of leadership with the people that you're on. And certainly, why don't we want to enjoy it? Jeez, leadership is hard enough as it is without it being not enjoyable. These are some of the organizations I've worked with. Huge span of, uh, of different kinds of industries from um, higher education to industry associations to um, government agencies to several not-for-profits all over Australia. So across all of these, I found common patterns and it's on the common patterns that I've written many books. Uh, my fourth book, People Stuff, as many of you know, 
won Book of the Year at the Australian Business Book Awards. So proud of that. <laughs> Such a shock to the system. Um, and all these diverse experiences across Canada and Australia, Canada, that was the other tip. If you haven't heard me speak before, I am Canadian originally, and I cannot say burger with any kind of authenticity. So I just stick to my Canadian accent, burger. Um, these patterns have given me lots of insights on what to do and what not to do. And also in my own leadership roles, I've had plenty of experience working out what does and doesn't work. Um, so let me get out of that for a second. Okay, stop share. Yeah. Here we go. Um, so in that, you know, I've been part of great teams. I've been part of teams that have fallen apart. So I know what it is to be part of an elite executive team. And I've been part of a team that just really sucks. Um, one of the things I've discovered is that it's often personalities. It's not personalities. It's systems. We often think it is personalities. And so we default to thinking it's only because Frank and Susan are so different that they have problems. But that's not necessarily the case. I got hair problems. Here we go. Um, and it's in looking at the structures in particular that we can help prevent some of these issues. So we're going to have a chat about that throughout this three part series, as well as a little bit uh, about that today. Okay. So getting into the nitty gritty of it, I did some research around this. And McKinsey had some pretty interesting things to say about what's happening out there in the leadership space. And what they discovered is that trust was pretty important. Duh, everybody knows that. But they discovered that there was a 23.7% increase in work effectiveness when there is trust in leadership. Now, I think this is an interesting thing. So you can boost results by building trust. Now, my tenet around that is that you don't want to focus on building trust. Trust is a byproduct of how we set our teams up. Uh, so I don't want us to get derailed by thinking that we need to build trust. And as soon as we're talking about trust in teams, we know that there is no trust. So park the trust thing and know that if you do the structures right, the systems right, the trust will come as a result. It's, it's a bit of a paradox, really. We needed to have elite teams, and yet we can't necessarily focus on it explicitly. So one of the things that you can do to help build trust is obviously communicate, be honest, and admit mistakes. That vulnerability is pretty important. Another piece of research um, included in this research from McKinsey from 2020, this is just last year. If, if you want a 55.5% increase in employee engagement, like 55% increase is huge, what you need to do is non-financial recognition. How good is that? So it won't cost you a penny. All you need to say is, good job. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty amazing. Like that's a pretty significant immediate return on investment in terms of time. So 55.5 all by doing a non-financial recognition piece. Um, that's just incredible how simple and easy that is. And here's the last statistic I want to share with you around their research. Well-being has been fundamentally important throughout the pandemic. It's come to the fore. Uh, resilience and wellness has been at the forefront of the conversations I'm having with leaders and how they can help steward that and steer that ongoing, not only just through the pandemic, but into the future. And if we want a 52.3% increase in well-being, implement fairness. <laughs> when fairness is present, well-being goes up. Now, fairness, my goodness, how do you define that? That's a pretty significant concept and it differs from person to person. I think that's why we come into a lot of uh, challenges uh, with this whole idea, idea of, of fairness. What I think is fair might be different to what you think is fair. So as leaders, how do we promote fairness? Well, we ask, don't tell. We ask people what they think is fair and explore it with them. So at least they feel heard. And it's often in just being heard that we can boost fairness. Okay, so that was um, some pretty interesting research to frame some of the context for today. And I think it's, those are pretty crucial things. And when we look at how do we get our teams to go from wherever they are to elite, we need to keep some of these principles in mind. When I was having conversations and reading through the answers to the prep questions I sent out when you registered about what is your biggest challenges that you have 
with your current leadership team. There was good news. There was a lot of strengths. People felt there was a lot of collaboration, a lot of support from one another, a lot of goodwill, a lot of good intentions. So that was the good news. The difficult stuff that people have is like sometimes it's a new team. It's like how do we figure out who fits where, how we uh, give out enough responsibility for people. That was one issue. Trust was another issue. How do we build trust? So there's that trust issue again. Um, there was also how do we get them to get their heads out of their own silo? Like that's a, that seems to be a major consistent conversation I'm having with CEOs. Every CEO wants their executive team to be elite, and that means being able to have a whole of organization perspective. And this seems to be the single most stumbling block that they have. Okay, so we hope to answer a lot of these challenges for you today. Um, now we're going to move to my model. <laughs> All right. Ta-da, something I prepared earlier. When it comes to mapping out where your team is, and in your notes, you'll be able to look at this, there's two axes that contributes to an elite team or not. One is the culture piece, and it's the culture of your executive team. That's the context in which I mean, and it's the cohesion of your culture. So down here, you might have less cohesion, and up here, you might have more cohesion. And on the horizontal axis, it's about strategy skills, and you might have less competence through to more competence, and that those two things, culture and cohesion, uh, sorry, culture and strategy skills of your executive team map out where your team might find themselves. So as we go through this, I want you to do an assessment of where you think your team is right now. So in the bottom left-hand corner where we have um, not much culture cohesion, so meaning people don't really feel a sense of camaraderie on the executive team, and they don't necessarily have a lot of skill and expertise in strategic skills in particular, that's where you have your novices. So this might be an entirely new executive team, or you might half the team might be new, or you might have had a restructure. Um, certainly this was my experience at Our Bound at about three or four years into my time working there on the executive. We had a big restructure and exit of staff. There, well, we had a restructure because a lot of the established leaders were leaving. There was going to be a huge vacuum at the top. And we hadn't done a really great job in preparing for succession, as many organizations don't. And so how were we going to contend with this? So we rejiggled the organizational structure and we had these new leaders in place. And a lot of them were like, don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Didn't necessarily know that I had to step in to fill these big shoes. How do we get this done? So this can be quite a challenging and exciting place to be. Uh, challenging because there's a lack of skill in both departments. It's exciting because uh, everyone's keen to make a contribution. Everybody wants to do a good job. So there's this huge will to do things well. So the opportunity in that is so you can harness that, that uh, excitement and enthusiasm to craft that novice team into something spectacular. So there are risks though, when we have a group of novices, is because there's not a lot of culture cohesion, you might have this sort of jostling position. So a little bit of pecking order stuff might come out. And you might have some people who want to really prove themselves. So you have this lone wolf thing happening. So you might have lone wolves emerge. Um, and you might have, let me see, uh, prima donnas also. <laughs> so people who want to shine above their peers. And then conversely, you might have turtles. People who are so intimidated, they just put their head down and focus on their own thing. So those are some of the risks that can happen at this stage of novices. But the opportunities are great because they all want to learn and grow. Now over here, when we build the strategic skills of our team, but maybe not the, at, uh, maybe not the cohesion, this is often where I have CEOs talking about their, their challenges are. And this is where we have stars. So quite often in the conversations I have with leaders is that their individual executives are highly competent in their area. They know their area inside and out. Um, and that's excellent. So they can be relied on to perform in their own area. But then this challenge of like, how do we get them to think cross sectorally? <laughs> how do we think, get them to think collaboratively? How do we get them to think whole of organization? 
And so they're lacking a little bit of strategic thinking skills here. So they're not quite, le quite all the way to the end in their strategic skills. And because they're so focused on their own areas, you, you have the silos emerge. So the risks with the stars is that silos can and competitiveness can emerge. Um, so it's kind of like the prima donna thing, but on steroids. And this can be quite problematic. Um, you might have competitiveness, egos. It's highly productive, our stars team. So uh, it's a team of stars, not a star team. That's the main distinction. Um, and all that knowledge is also really good. So the risks are you end up having some of the four devils of people stuff emerge, especially if any cuts to their programs. You might have some autonomy issues, challenges, outrage of their section gets uh, passed over or disregarded. So it can be quite volatile emotionally here as well if we haven't worked on the cohesion piece of the culture. The opportunity is that there's so much experience here. You can harness that and develop it and move them straight into the box above, which is the elite team, which I'll get to in a moment. All right. So up here where we have, we've worked on the cohesion, but not necessarily the strategic skills. We have what I call the amateurs. And this is actually a really fun team. <laughs> they love being together. They're very, um, generous with one another, they're curious and interested in each other, and they're gung-ho, they're enthusiastic, but they may not be great at execution and delivery uh, because they haven't necessarily mastered either the leadership fundamentals or any of the advanced leadership skills. And so they may struggle to actually put a project together and deliver on it. So the risks here is there might be a bit of butt covering so they might make some big mistakes and try and cover that up and smooth it over. They might be unproductive and they might actually be blind to their mistakes. They may not even know that they're making mistakes because they lack the experience and expertise around there. Uh, the, good op the, the opportunity here, though, is that this is a good culture that you can grow and develop. And it's simply a, a question of taking to task their experience and their skill level to move them across. And move them across to the last one, which is the elite executive teams, where you have a strong culture cohesion and strong cohesive culture and really strong strategy skills. And that's the elites. Da, da, da. And this is like nirvana for the CEO most of the time. What is it like to work on a elite team? Well, this is where your leaders, your executive are proactive they are whole of organization oriented. Um, there's redundancy in the leadership system because each of them knows each other's roles and can fill in for one another as well as for the CEO. So this CEO, God forbid, would like to have a holiday. There is somebody who can step in and play acting CEO, no dramas. And that kind of backing each other up is one of the critical aspects of this. There's deep collaboration, there's great innovation. We can rigorous, rigorously challenge each other. Um, and not afraid to throw out the status quo if it's no longer relevant. So that is like, huh, that's when you're getting real traction and it's really something that we should all be working towards. It's a bigger and better, like opportunities are bigger and better here when we have an elite team like this. There are also some risks. <laughs> the risks here are your team might be singularly or collectively very ambitious. And what does that mean? If they can't go further up, do they go out? And you might end up losing some unless there's some sort of development program for them at this point. Uh, so that is one of the risks that we've got here. And the other two risks are around you, the CEO. What I mean by that is that you as the CEO, and I've had conversations with CEOs when their team starts to perform like this, you can have the sense of uh, feeling a little bit redundant. <laughs> if they can all do the job better than me, what do I do? Where do I go next? And they have a little crisis of confidence. And so we can, as CEOs in this team, feel a little jealous, perhaps, of the achievements of our team. This is if we're not looking after our own emotional maturity here. Um, so this can be problematic, and we may be unwittingly stamping on their ambitions, not deliberately, unintentionally. Or you might be feeling at a loose end. Uh, so where to from here? And the opportunity for the CEO with an elite team 
is to keep challenging the elite team and themselves to what else can we contribute? How else can we, how else can we move forward? So a couple of examples, I guess. Um, with the novices, I already spoke to you about that with the Outward Bound crew. It was a restructure that caused that. Um, the amateurs, I've, I've worked with, with some industry groups that are kind of amateurs. They're so enthusiastic. They love hanging out with each other. Um, they're familiar with each other professionally, but not necessarily have all the leadership skills. And they're in that roles because the industry bodies require representation. And so they get nominated and elected by their peers and they're there, but they're kind of winging it. <laughs> this happens a lot in a lot of industry associations and they kind of, they know, they know that they're limited by that. Um, so that can be kind of a dangerous place, exciting and potentially dangerous. With the elite, I've worked with one leader who has an elite team and I would say what characterizes his leadership, which might characterize your leadership as well, is that he's incredibly humble. Like he, he doesn't have any massive personal ambitions to wear the mantle and the crowns and whatever. He genuinely, genuinely is committed to the success of the organization and the industry in which he finds himself. And whatever he does is in service to that. And he needs to look after himself. And he set his, his executive team up so that when he had to take time off for a uh, medical timeout, one of his team members could step into that role and handle it well. And he did not feel any jealousy at all coming back into that or any threat to that. They all had each other's backs and were all dedicated and committed to the outcome of the organization. All right, so I wanna press pause now and I would love for you in the chat box to tell us where your team is so I can get a sense of in the second half of the webcast where we can go, where I need to put my emphasis on in terms of um, which area to dive in more. So where is your team? Novices, stars, amateurs, or elite? That'd be good to know that. Okay. All right, so let's have a look. Team of stars, one star and one amateur, some elites hiring novices and training them to keep our culture. Okay, cool. Stars, but improving cohesion. Yeah, yeah, I think we can always improve cohesion. <laughs> awesome. Some, some in each quadrant, so not a collective across one okay more towards elite division is toward amateurs amateur to elite okay somewhere between amateur and elite organizational change okay fantastic that's great so a bit of a, a smattering a smattering spattering <laughs> i don't know what the word is <laughs> i'm gonna put you in chat boxes now in groups of three and this is your assignment you're going to um, each person you're going to be in groups of three introduce yourself Talk to where you think your team is or members of your team is. And the question for each of you to answer is, what is one thing you think you can do to move your team from wherever it is to elite? So what do you think is the strategy you need to take in order to move them to elite? And then when you come back, we'll unpack the strategies of wherever you are, of how do we move up to elite? Okay, so the instructions again, introduce yourself, where's your team? what one thing you need to do right now. You'll have 12 minutes total. I'll give little reminders. And that means you're gonna have four minutes each in your groups of three. Okay, breakout rooms, here we go. Oh, geez, how many of are you there? I think you might be, let's see. Sign, sign, let's... okay. I think that's going to work. Yeah, so there might be one group of four. You guys will have three minutes each. <laughs> All right, I'll see you in 12 minutes. Uh, so you will need to click accept and move into your rooms. Okay, press pause on the recording. Okay, so in the chat box, if you have a one thing, please pop it into what one thing could you do 
to, to help your team go to elite. And I'll share what I think you need to do to get you to elite. Alignment of purpose and strategy. Yeah, okay, yeah. Darren's going to use this as introducing discussions about where we're at and where we want them to be. Great. Spend some time together, build deeper understanding relationships, the cohesion piece. Training and values alignment. Yep. Support and develop their strategic thinking. Yep. Great. Discuss and allocate an organization-wide project to the directors separately. Hmm. Very good. Include some corporate-wide accountability. Good. Like that, Mark. Offsites and create more time for organizational-wide perspectives. Love offsites. <laughs> big fan fantastic well thank you for sharing that um, that's terrific so I'm going to unpack and give you uh, an additional roadmap to help shift from wherever you think you are to where you could go and some of them will align with what you've already shared and there might be a, a few other things in there for you okay let's get these little slides up again voila okay uh, so the first question I was going to ask you is, which way should novices go? But I've given the answer away. <laughs> if you have a novice team, should you work on building stars or should you work on, on creating amateurs? And um, as you can see, my red arrow says, build the amateurs first. So focus on culture cohesion first. And why would I say that? It's because when you have a really strong, cohesive team, you can weather any storm. And I think that when you have a group of novices, you're already in a storm, so you need each other. So the faster that you can get common, uh, uh, common ground, a common understanding, and getting to know each other, the easier it is to then face the organizational challenges. Now, you probably don't wanna spend a lot of time doing this, but it does, the good news is you don't need a lot of time to start to build that sense of cohesiveness. Um, so, and why do I say here and not to stars? because of the challenges that exist with stars. So if you start building a novice team and start building their skills only, then you run the risk of prima donnas, competitiveness, and all the other things I listed as risks for stars. So better to build trust. There you go, I just contradicted myself. Better to build cohesiveness and understanding with one another before you start building skills. But it doesn't have to take a lot of time. Um, you should probably only really move novices to stars if you are in a crisis situation where you've had a massive spill and fill and the organization is behind the eight ball and really you need to focus on delivering. And that's probably a good time to focus on let's get these people upskilled and we'll work on the cohesion as we go along. Um, so that's the only time I would recommend that you focus on moving novices to stars as a starting point. Uh, otherwise, I'd go cohesion first, then skills. So along with that, here are three things you can do to help novices move to uh, amateurs. And some of you are already right on the money there. Your culture compass is about alignment. So what are your values, your vision, your purpose? How do you want to operate as a team? Um, profiles is about getting to know you. So any profiling instrument will work wonders, whether whatever your favorite one is. Some people like HBDI, Myers-Briggs. I personally love DISC because it's about behavior and it's very adaptable and it's an easy people reading tool. Uh, you could do something more advanced like the leadership maturity framework that I often do with my coaching clients, which looks at what is your worldview and where do you sit? Um, another one I have is a leadership values assessment, which showcases where is the map of your values as an individual. You can also do that collectively as a team so that you can see, does, do your values support where your organization needs to go? So any kind of profiling is really helpful at this point to get to understand self and how you fit within the greater team. And the get to know you retreat, offsites, <laughs> yay. So this is the cohesion piece, um, absolutely, that you can do. So that's the high level roadmap there. If you wanna know what a culture compass is, um, just email me that. I have a handout that goes along with my, second, my third book, Loyalty which unpacks exactly what you need to do that. You can have that for free, no worries. Just email me saying Culture Compass and I can send that to you. All right, so how to move amateurs to elite. Quite a few of you said that you had some amateurs and you want to move them there. So this is about building your high level strategic capability. 
And so what you need to do is um, leadership skills, the fundamentals. And the fundamental uh, leadership skills are focused around leading self, leading others, and performing tasks, executing on task, self, others, and task. So it has fundamentals like productivity, coaching, delegation, uh, feedback, difficult conversations. Those fundamentals are pretty critical. If you don't have those, there's no way you're ever getting to elite stage. Advanced leadership skills are, there's four main ones main ones. There's lead, leading change, leading culture, leading strategy, and leading performance. Now, if you didn't get any of that, don't worry. <laughs> I have two diagnostics that I will email you as a follow-up to this, which go through in great detail all of those things. So you can do a self-check on both the leadership fundamentals and advanced leadership skills against these diagnostics to gauge where your team is sitting across each of those. And the third one is about shadowing, learning each other's job roles. And, um, and you can do that by doing a day in the life. It doesn't have to be a whole day spent in each other's divisions, but you can have at one of your meetings, have one of your executive saying, like, this is what my world looks like. These are my challenges. These are the resources I have. Uh, this is what we're trying to do here. This is what my day-to-day -day life looks like. That's a really useful way to introducing the shadowing concept and that getting everybody's heads outside of their own silo to see what their peers are doing. So that's what you can do, amateurs to elite. So stars to elite. Yeah. Now, this may seem counterintuitive because a lot of the, a lot of the things that you can do here are moving people is actually honing their skills as opposed to their cohesion. So I would say advanced leadership skills actually does two things at once. It teaches them to think in systems. That's leading culture, strategy, change, and performance. It teaches your people to think whole of organization anyway. And in doing so, you start to naturally build an empathy and understanding for your colleagues. So you kind of hit two birds with one stone in doing that. Uh, because if you're going to think whole of organization, you kind of have to look at your peer and go, oh, you're a partner in the performance of this organization. I, I need to know about that. I need to know about you and how you operate so that I can back you up and you can back me up. So I think this is a really smart way to achieve the cohesion piece and with doing two birds with one stone, so to speak. The 25 year visioning. Now, this is really honing an elite perspective. It's about pulling them into the future in 25 years, right? How many people do 25 year visioning? Not that many. Usually we're stuck to one to three to five year horizons. But when you sit with your team and ask them to do this exercise, which is first of all, reflect on your previous 25 years of your life and work and list all the achievements you've had to date and imagine yourself back 25 years ago. So when I did this exercise, I'm 50 now. Imagine myself at 25, I was still working at summer camp, just starting maybe considering moving to Australia, or not even moving, going to Australia for some work. I had no concept of what lay ahead or what could lay ahead of me. Uh, all the achievements, the books I've published, all, nothing, had nothing in my horizon. Now, imagine at 25, if I had been intentional about what I wanted to create with a big picture future, who knows what else I could create, but I'm 50 now looking towards 75. If I start to see the possibilities for myself and for my business, for my organization, my community, I will start to focus on the opportunities that will bring this to life. So you can do this with your executive team too. What's their 25 year to date achievements, assuming they're older than 22. <laughs> I had one guy in a workshop yesterday, he was 24. I'm like, wow, <laughs> it's so young. Bless him. Um, looking forward 25 years, what seeds of opportunity could we create together in this organization for ourselves? And so we start moving the mind in a much more expanded way. And so you get your team to start thinking way more expansively than, than just dealing with the day-to-day. -day. You don't throw out the day-to-day, -day, but you do both. So the 25 year visioning is one way to stretch people into that. And something happens when you start to do that. Like, this kind of wonder happens and you start to brain and train people in your collective. This is something good to do at your offsite leadership retreat, which I totally advocate, which is not on this list, but you could and should be doing if you're trying to take your stars to elite. This is absolutely the time to do an offsite to get to know each other better, to do those pieces as well as these other pieces. And the shadowing piece shows up here too. So 
big picture holistic thinking is really critical as well as the uh, the skill based thing and the future thinking as well as the getting to know each other stuff all right so what about this one what about novices to stars what do you do there well if you have to do it this is what i recommend make sure you nail the leadership fundamentals which again are about me them me sorry self other and task that's all about productivity communication emotional intelligence uh debriefing debriefing feedback difficult conversations those kind of really important people skills this piece is really important and it's developing kpis not for individuals but for departments and systems and that way if you if you set them for individuals then you run the risk of setting up for prima donnas and lone wolves so set your kpis as a collective and this is really important um, you're going to be doing lots of one-on-ones and you may want to establish a team war council to again to actually build cohesion as you're developing skills together so that's kind of like your uh, crisis mode if you need to move novices to stars quickly and the side effect is actually in a crisis you'll probably build those that cohesion and team connection all of us who went through the pandemic had that sensation with our teams generally it's like we bought we just came together in the crisis and worked hard it's only when the crisis backed off a little bit the cracks that were there kind of opened up a little okay and this is the last big one how do you go from novices to elite do we have to go through these other cycles you don't have to go through those other cycles. This just takes longer. This is a one year plan. So if you're starting from scratch, this is the recipe that and sequence I would recommend. <clears throat> of course, now the breakout room thing is in my way. I can't read my own notes. Just hang on a second. <laughs> Move this thing out of the way. Okay, here we go. Team identity. And I think in your notes, I saw that this afternoon, it said team indemnity. <laughs> it's not meant to be indemnities, team identity and mission retreat. So your offsite, this is what you want to do. You do your culture compass, you do your profiling, you get to net, get to know your activities and you do introduction to strategy. So you're doing bonding and strategic thinking all at once. Then you start to work on the skills development piece, get the leadership fundamentals honed, do your KPIs, collective ones, not individual ones necessarily. And you can be doing lots of one-on-ones to make sure that they're feeling comfortable and that they're checking in, you're delegating effectively and they're rising to the occasion. And the third piece is leverage your skills now. So you upgrade them quickly, advanced leadership skills, 25 year visioning and shadowing. So that's your roadmap for if you had to start from scratch and go from, uh, from go to woe, woe to go. I never understood that expression, but if you had to start from the scratch, and get to elite, that's how you would do it. Now, you can, for the do it yourself version, like I said, I've got two assessments, two um, checklists that I'm gonna send after this to help you look at the leadership fundamentals and the advanced leadership skills. And if you already have a preferred provider to do that, get them on board and get them operating. If you don't have a preferred training provider, hello, I'm your girl. <laughs> that's my entire sales pitch for that. Um, I love doing leadership training, both fundamentals and advanced. It's where I come to life. And I love facilitating retreats as well. Um, just saying. And I know some really amazing places to go if you don't have, um, if you're just looking for venue recommendations, I can do that too. All right, so that's the journey. Let's talk about some mistakes. Oh. Assuming the team knows what high performance is. <laughs> because we all have in our mind what that actually means. High performance is delivering consistently on results, but not just results on impact. And in next week's class class webinar, we're going to talk explicitly what the difference is between a championship a champion mindset and a performance mindset. And they are quite different. So we need to make sure that we have this nailed down and we need to, that your team knows what's expected of them. This is often a big mistake is not letting them know. Um, the other mistake is expecting the team to see the bigger picture automatically. How could they? They're probably just scrambling to keep on top of their own requirements. And there's not necessarily a woof em, a what's in it for me to get ahead of and know the big picture. There's a definitely a what's in it for you as CEO, but not necessarily for your team executive. So we can't necessarily expect them to jump to the bigger picture. We need to guide them to do that and show them why it's important for them. And this is the last mistake is not doing anything to build competence. 
um, and cohesion. So if you do nothing, that's often a big mistake. But because you've turned up here, I know that's not you, which is good. Here's a little special opportunity. If you don't have any of my books or if you want some more of them, there's a special massive book deal on. So we cut the book bundle down to 50 bucks instead of 99. So if you want to get some more books for your team, um, go ahead and order that. I will send a link, better put that in the notes as well, um, to our bookshop so you can get the books. I will happily sign them for you as well. Uh, okay, so your homework, dun, dun, dun. don't worry, should be easy. Go through the leadership fundamental ch checklist and check how good your executive team is now with that. Um, check your advanced, same thing with your advanced leadership skills, where are they at? And the third thing is plan a culture cohesion piece. Whether you go off site or whether you go out to lunch, you do something that's going to be building that cohesiveness. That will never go old and it will always pay off. Um, it seems like an expense, it's an investment. So completely, massively, ex explicitly do that. I'm not even sure those adverbs worked, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Just do it. Okay. Let me get out of that, stop, share. All right, so we're coming to the end of a fulsome session with lots of key takeaways. It's fairly high level. Um, we were gonna, next session, next webinar, we're gonna drill down into the actual structure and skills and frameworks for an, for an elite team. And we're also gonna look at the neuroscience of group flow and how you can cultivate that with your team. So we're gonna look at the really, the ins and outs of the elite team there. Uh, so this today was about the roadmap. Now, next week is the nuts and bolts of how to do the elite stuff, which is so exciting. Um, before you shoot off, and we are coming up to time, if you have a question, pop a question. If you don't have a question, I'd love to hear or read what your key takeaway was from today's session. Um, that just gives me a gauge as to what was most useful for you so I can shape the content uh, next week to best suit. So what was your key takeaway in the chat box? And then I will wrap it all up for you. Okay, looks like I need to send edible, edible, editable PDFs. Yes, I've been procrastinating on learning how to do that. <laughs> so I will send out Word docs uh, in the meantime, and I will commit to learning how to do editable, editable PDFs for you. Yeah. Yeah, don't assume. Moving from stars to elite, cool. How do you stop other people carrying the low performers with collective KPIs? So you stop that by having rigorous conversations. Um, so people say, ah, how do you create accountability? Um, when you have collective KPIs, you need to work on the cohesion piece so people can't escape and that it's the team that holds, that calls each other to account. Um, and that way you won't necessarily need to worry about people ducking and weaving. And it could be if you have shirkers like that, that they, they don't have the skills yet. It's not always motivation. Sometimes it's skills and they hide. Okay. Having one of my executive team here, framing and mindset. The difference between a personality thing and a system thing. Yeah. So Liz, um, that's Liz Ferry's question. What's the difference between a personality problem and a system problem? Most team problems look like personality problems on the surface. But when you start to dive down, you will f discover that there's probably some systems that aren't quite working, whether they're remuneration, whether they're uh, recruitment, whether they're recognition. Uh, whether they're delegations, some of those fundamental systems are probably tr driving a wedge between people. So it can come across as a personality problem, uh, but it's not. It's often a systems problem or the team hasn't done enough cohesiveness work, not enough work around how to have difficult conversations in order to s resolve those issues or they're lacking one of the fundamentals. Hopefully that, that's a very brief. It's, there's more on that in my book, People Stuff, if you haven't got that book yet. Okay, key steps to build from different stages. Yeah, culture cohesion event. Yes, so fun. This is like having a small team that is very remote. I miss having offsites, that's for sure. Uh, do you have a set of systems that you help implement? Uh, yeah, it's the people systems. Um, set of systems. I don't really have a system implementation program. We could have a separate conversation about that, I think. Um, who has asked me about that? Paul. 
Um, so send me an email after that. I'll, we can have a conversation about what you're after. Okay, Craig's got to go. You all have to go. Thank you so much for showing up tonight and participating. I really appreciate it. I look forward to next week where we go into the nuts and bolts of executive teams. I'll stay online for anybody who wants to continue to ask questions. Otherwise, we're free to go into your evening. I fare thee well. <laughs> and I'll see you next week.